Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and I am joined today by my brother, the Gritty Broman. How are you, Brent? I'm well, thank you. It's early in the morning. It's stupid early. We're knocking this podcast <laughs> out early. Uh, today, we're going to talk about boots and feet, uh, hiking, kind of a foot system. Now, I just completed a hike with a bunch of different hikers. We kind of did a group hike up there in uh, Montana uh, along the Gallatin River. It was a fun hike. We got together, did a little Q&A with a bunch of folks that were really cool that came to the hike. And we got a lot of questions around boots. People were asking me about boots. And everyone there kind of had their different boot as well that they had, you know, uh, been using. And uh, I got asked about socks, just a lot of questions, sheep feet, and so on. So here is an assortment of boots right here. What is that? What do I got? Two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different styles of boot. These are all crispy boots. Are you wearing some boots as well? Uh, No, but I am wearing some crispy shoes. Hmm. We'll talk about those too. Some tennis shoes. Um, But these boots i i've been fortunate because i get to test and try a lot of different different mm-hmm. boots see how they feel do and i do lots i mean i spend a lot of time hiking or in the mountains hunting so i get to use them day after day now i have my opinions because based on my feet my experience mm-hmm. my feet sweat a lot what i've learned just from hunting with different guys uh avid hikers backpackers everybody has a different you you, i what i use and what works for me isn't going to work for lampers and what lampers use isn't going to work for me and the same is true with ben anthony dad like everybody's just a little different and sometimes you know sometimes what i have is perfect for another guys but what i figured i'd do is go over each of these boots how i like to use them how they're different my opinions and Mostly, though, what I think is useful is we're going to get into the socks and talk how I run socks. I think that the sock liner and the sock itself are critical. You know, I can get away with a lot of different boots as long as I have the right socks on. Now, I am a sweater. I have pretty sweaty feet. Uh, Some people don't. Uh, My wife's feet don't draw like they don't sweat at all. They're like little crusty, you know, dry dry things that just don't sweat. Um, that's strange to me because my feet gush sweat all day long, <laughs> uh, especially when I get an adrenaline burst. My hands and feet sweat quite a bit. Do you know what uh, chronically sweaty feet is called? No. Is uh, there a name for it? Uh, hyperhidrosis. It's more common in men than it is in women. Mm-hmm. Hyperhidrosis. Mm-hmm. So it's also linked to having sweaty palms. So if you uh, have sweaty feet, but like maybe you're getting excited, you're ready to shoot an animal, your palms might sweat a little bit more than average. Oh, yeah. yeah. My hands and feet go nuts. See, my feet sweat, but my hands don't sweat. No, uh, if I hold my wife's hand in a movie, like with an exciting <laughs> scene, it's like, like she'll let go of my hand because it's, it's like, just Wah. drenched. No. Um, Hyperhidrosis. So it's funny, my hands and feet are super soft. And even when I get calloused, I'll get super calloused hands from hunting and being outdoors. And then within, I'd say, seven to 10 days, they're absolutely soft. And then they'll callous right back up and then they'll go soft. And <laughs> it just uh, very hydrated my feet. My wife's like, You have such soft hands. It's like, Well, they're well moisture. They're, they'll come back and they'll be crusty, you know, and hard and calloused. And then right away, I've never had, like, she's, she has issues with dryness, always putting some kind of lotion. She even has some prescriptions, trying to deal with how how her feet and hands can mm-hmm. get so dry. Never, uh, never, I don't, I can't relate. So given that reality, you know, you got to know you, and that's a spectrum of extremes between her and I. Somewhere in the middle is where you might lie. You might be even more hyperhidrosis than I am. <laughs> Uh, and, a, I like that word, hyperhidrosis. And so um, keep that in mind. Now let's go through these boots. Uh, my all-time favorite all-around boot that I think is probably the best boot for almost everyone for if you want to buy one boot that does it all. My opinion is the Crispy Nevada is the best boot. And uh, I've put 
you know, a couple thousand miles, 20, 2,500 miles on a pair of Nevadas. And they just, they last forever. They're a very supple leather. I like the blend of stiffness. I like leather. Leather almost never um, leaks. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have between the uh, Gore-Tex liner and all that, that's in the in the boot itself, and then combined with the fact that it's leather, you just don't get these coming back with leaking issues. Where with a synthetic boot, sometimes you can. Like this is my wife's boot right here, and it's a crispy summit and um you know some of this stuff you get a needle you get a thorn rather poking through here like it's like a needle it goes right through some of this material that's like canvasy and softer this synthetic uh leather and it'll it breathes nice and it's super lightweight and it's a great feeling boot but there's that potential for that Gore-Tex to get a tiny hole in it once that happens you submerge the boot walk through tall wet grass you could get uh water pushing through so that's why i do do really like leather now the downside to leather is it can be warm you know it can get a little hot and your feet can sweat a little more it's it's not as ideal for hot weather now i've used this is the crispy nevada uninsulated and i use this boot throughout the whole bear season and it it does the job for me now, my feet get a little sweaty. I got to take them out at the top of a mountain after I've hiked a few miles straight up, let my feet air out. That's another thing. Heat and moisture are the enemy of your feet in these backcountry hunts on any hike, really. So once those feet get really hot, and I tend to wear this boot because I like the stability, I like the, the stiffness, I like the comfort and all, all of that, uh, and it's not insulated, but yet it it doesn't breathe super well the way that because uh, it is leather and it is it is a thicker boot. But I can take my foot out of this and air it out and stick it right back in. And because I have great socks, you know they're wicking the moisture away from my from my foot and my skin out into the sock. Pull the sock out and it dries really quick in the wind and the in the in the air. And I can slip it right back into the boot. And generally, that's kind of how I manage the moisture and some of the heat in this particular boot the rest of the year outside of spring bear i really don't have any issue with my feet getting too hot it doesn't really come to an issue when i'm hunting in september so the crispy nevada for me is kind of that favorite one boot that does it all now i have over here you'll see this is a crispy colorado and this boot I really like. It's sort of like the Summit Upper. Okay, here's this my wife's Summit. They they have a very similar uh, uh, build, and I've always loved the Summit. But the Summit doesn't have the ABSS system in it. Now the a, the the um, ABSS is the ankle brace ankle brace system. Uh, I forget ankle bone stability system or something like that ankle bone stability system or I don't know but the point is it's uh support so you don't sprain your ankle and it's really at the end of the day important for me I broke my left uh ankle twice where I snapped the bones and the ligaments uh both in while in high school and then I broke my right ankle one time uh each time I had to wear a cast for months on end and rehabilitate and do a bunch of uh, physical therapy for the ligaments after they were torn. And my ankles are just kind of, they're just weak. Those old injuries are a problem. So I roll ankles really easily with, unless I have the right, the right stability. And I've never rolled an ankle in a crispy boot that has the ABSS. The uh, ankle bone support system. Ankle bone support system. Okay. Brent looked it up. So the ABSS is in this crispy Colorado. And uh, like I said, so it's got like the benefits and the breathability and the lightweight and the comfort of the, the Summit, which I love. But it, this boot has the ABSS where the Summit does not. It kind of rules the Summit out for me except for just casual hiking. I used the Summit one time up in the mountains in uh, British Columbia, hunting mountain goat. And I put almost the whole goat in my pack and I was hiking off the mountain with this thing, it was heavy load and it was real wet and slimy rocks. And, you know, it was pretty 
nasty hiking and I um I slipped on some moss covered slimy rock that was wet slid and my foot my ankle just with the weight of the pack it just rolled it and snapped it and um so much it just swelled up like a a softball like it was it was bad and then uh, I popped some ibuprofen and had to hike out you know mm. best I could with the load the guys helped carry out some of it but what ended up happening was as a result of that, I was like, you know, as much as I love this crispy summit, it just, I can't afford to be back in these places without the ankle bone support system. So I was real excited when they came out with the Colorado because it's got that crispy summit upper, super breathable, lightweight system. And it is, it's so much cooler to hike in this in hot weather than the all leather, full grain leather kind of system. So I love this. And then the boot itself, the, the sole is, uh, but the sole is a little stiffer. And uh, so I started wearing this and I would wear, I was testing the two boots out and I take this uh, Colorado and uh, I'd wear one on the left foot and then I'd wear a Nevada on the right foot. And then I'd hike three miles up a mountain and back down, do like a four to six mile round trip hike with one boot on each foot. And I was really trying to see, okay, what, what do we got for stability and comfort? And then I'd switch feet and do the same thing. So I wore the crispy on the left, the, the Colorado on the left foot and the Nevada on the right. And I did this for a couple of weeks uh, to really get a feel for, you know, how each one felt. Well, on those hikes that were vertical, straight up, straight down, you know, I'd park at the trailhead and I'd just climb these mountains and go back, go up and down. I loved the Colorado. Uh, it was quickly becoming a favorite boot. There was an undeniable performance gain uh, in the Colorado, less foot fatigue, the uphill, downhill felt better. I had more stability uh, in the boot than in the Nevada. Uh, it felt great. It felt great. Then I decided, okay, well, after this kind of testing up here on the mountain, I'm going to go on a long extended hunt. So I went on a 12 day bear hunt with Ryan Lampers and Jeff Lusk. And we went pretty deep and hiked crazy miles, okay? And uh, what ha ended up happening was the the boot would leave my foot, foot pretty fatigued, and it was kind of hard on the, my heel, the back of my heel. After wearing it even more on, on a couple other hunts, what I came, the realization I came to was the crispy Nevada or the, the Colorado is ideal for your kind of sheep, early season, warmer weather, straight up vertical type hunts. Like maybe uh, my hunts in, in New Zealand, especially, they were pretty vertical. You know, you get to the base of the mountain and you're just, you're up in these straight up, straight down kind of terrain a lot. But it really underperformed for me on the more gradual terrain. I ended up going back to the Nevada primarily for all my hunts because uh, the Colorado's a little too stiff for me on all the flats. So you put a heavy pack on and you're hiking on gra you know, trails and you're doing elk hunting on, you know, on, on low country. Then you hit some highs and then you go back to low country. And what I realized was if I wear my Nevadas for 10 or 12 days, I have no foot fatigue. I slip those boots off generally. And it's like, I just feel great. I'm not in a, I'm not eager to get the boots off after a 10, 12 mile hike, 15 mile hike. I'm not going, Oh, I got to get these boots off. Oh man, my feet, which is how I felt in the past with a lot of boots I used to wear. It's like, man, get these boots off there. I've been in them all day. That doesn't happen in the Nevada. Now in the Colorado, I get that way. And I only noticed that on these, on an extended day after day, extended trip hunt. That's when I realized, okay, the Colorado for me is a little too stiff. And if I wear it all day, every day, by the end of each day, I am dying to get the boot off. Now on these short little jaunts up the mountain, two or three miles that are vertical, and then I come back down, I would prefer the Colorado. But then if I got to hike eight miles, you know, on flat and I'm, I'm racking up, you know, 10 or 15 miles per day, I need a softer boot is what it boiled down to. I needed a boot that fit me better. And for whatever reason, that's where the Nevada comes in. Okay. 
that's my take. If I go on a sheep or goat hunt, and especially if it's early season and it's hot, that kind of thing, or just in some mountain country for maybe August for mule deer up in the steeps, then I think I, I would I would uh, roll with this Colorado. But it's really tough for me to leave the Nevada behind just because it is so comfortable. It, it's it's the one boot that does it all for me. Uh, and like I said, the only downside for me with the Nevada is heat. It gets a little bit too warm being a full grain leather in really hot weather. Even the uninsulated pair, which is what I've got here. I've got both the insulated and the un- uninsulated. It's just a little too warm. So that that's my struggle, but I deal with that by pulling my foot out of the boot when it gets real, real sweaty. I take the time to just sort of or air out the feet throughout the day a couple of times if that if that's necessary and that kind of solves my problem. So that's my take on the on this Colorado versus the Nevada. Now I've met guys that absolutely love this Colorado. And so if you're a stiff boot guy and you like lightweight and you like breathability, you want that ankle stability, yeah, it's tough to beat this Colorado. It's a pretty sweet boot. You'll probably love it. Uh, like I said, I need boot that's not that's that's not quite so stiff. It's it's great. Like I said, for like a half day kind of hike, perfect. If I got to double that or got to live in the boot day hour after hour, it just uh, a little too much stiffness for me. That brings me to this boot I've been running for the past few months, which is the crispy brick stall. Now this boot. I got to say, it's still, for me, in a testing phase. Everyone I know who's used this boot absolutely loves it. Most of the guys in this building here, they love this boot. Tons of guys I, I've you know spoken to, this is their favorite boot at, that Crispy makes. It's a little stiffer than the Nevada, but I will say I've been, I've been hiking with it a lot lately. It's got the ankle brace support system. It's got a nice rocker. So you walk and there's not a lot of foot fatigue, you know, it's like, it's almost helping you walk, like pushing you along. It's a nice feel, uh, laces up real nice. So there's, there's no, you know, your foot's not slipping or sliding inside, inside the boot. Um, it's got a lot of traction. I mean, so far I am really impressed with this boot. I don't know if it's going to, replace the Nevada for me, but it's super close, especially for early season. And I'll tell you why this boot is actually, it does have insulation, but the tongue here is neoprene. Mm. And so it's sort of like, imagine your house, it's really insulated. You know, it's got, it's a well-insulated home, but what happens when you leave the front door open? Well, mom beats your ass. That's what happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he, when you leave the front door open and it's and it's uh, a cold outside, that cold air is going to rush in. If it's warm, warm outside, that hot air is going to wreck your AC. Like leaving the front door open is a major difference. So this boot is actually insulated, but that's what I found with this boot as I'm messing around with it. I'm really stoked on it. I so wore you said it, it's in a testing phase. How many miles would you say you've gone on it? Oh, <clears throat> maybe a hundred. Okay. Yeah. Most people would say that's past the testing phase. I would feel like. Mm. So far, I'm I'm like I've blown According away. To I've learned online between five and seven hundred miles is when you should replace that boot. So technically, you've walked one fifth of that boot's life away already. <laughs> I think. I think. I don't know where those numbers come from or who comes up with them. They just sound like a good number. Uh, yeah, and that's what they say. Yet I put two thousand miles on boots before mm-hmm. their time to go or more. Ryan is uh, well. Ryan is right in that number too. He probably needs to. Replace he did twenty five hundred on his on one Laponia. He did two thousand two hundred on or something like that on another mm-hmm. pair. Two thousand on another pair. Um, doesn't take us long to rack up those kind of miles doing what we do. Oh, that's a yearly occurrence, but or less. Yeah. What's the difference between, because he got 22,000 miles and he got 2,500 on another pair. Mm-hmm. 500 miles seems like a big gap right there. What was he doing differently? We'd, I asked him that on one of the last uh, videos. Um, he, he wasn't sure. He thought maybe because of the blowdowns in a lot of the fallen timber, you know, that he caught, he he knows he caught like a stick mm-hmm. in one of them and it ripped a seam and 
once that went, it kind of cascaded into other issues and um, chink in the armor, and it just went from there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I I've I'd say the toughest terrain, some of the toughest terrain I've ever put boots through was in New Zealand, and it was mm-hmm. straight vertical, like like steep steep stuff. Like you you're gonna die on cliffs stuff, and then it was rocky like sharp sharp rocky country and shale and it was never ending Mm -hmm. it was like rock glass and then the snow itself was hard and would it was so frozen on the surface at some times and crunchy and you're punching through you got some gators on the gators got torn up my gators got thrashed i was Mm -hmm. wearing the sitka gators they lasted like a day ryan was running some other gators and they were fine. And so it, it's gators are not created equal Mm -hmm. and some brands have a great design and some we've learned suck. They don't even (laughs) last a week. They don't last. They, they're great when you're in wet conditions, hiking in wet grass in Prince of Wales Island, you get into the snow in this rocky country, they're done in a, couple of days shredded they're just shredded they the way that they uh, are designed the way that they attach to your boot they're just they're they're there's a flaw in that design and they're a bad idea so back to the brick stall you were saying so it's like having the screen door open because of this the way the tongue is Mm -hmm. is made and and uh i was hunting in ohio well british columbia as well and uh, with guys who had the brick stall and they're like it's insulated to the same degree as the Crispy Nevada. Yeah, I think it's, you could look it up. It's 400 grams of insulation, I think, maybe six, the insulated versions. I'm not sure. Anyway, they're insulated. And yet the dudes that were wearing the brick stall, their feet were freezing to death. And this is in, you know, freezing temps. And I was like, well, they have the same insulation. It's kind of what they were saying. Mm -hmm. How can my feet be so cold? You know, on horseback, it's a nightmare because your feet are just out there in the stirrups blowing in the wind. You're not walking around, moving blood around, and it becomes a very uncomfortable experience as your toes freeze up. And so what happens is uh, the Brickstall breathes really well. So right now I'm hiking with it July, you know, August. I'm going to put the paces through this boot. It definitely breathes a lot better than my Nevada that's uninsulated. Now I was talking to Cole, uh, I was talking to uh, Kendall Card, who who is right there with Black Ovis and and Crispy, owner of the company here, the distribution in the U.S. And uh, I was asking him about the Brickstall. He's like, man, it's a nice boot. And we were talking about it for quite a while. I'm like, but if you had to choose, if you had to choose one boot, you know, that you really, really, you know, for the summer, mm-hmm. w- which one would you choose? Would you choose the Brickstall? What would you choose? Because he really loves this boot. He's like... I think I'd still, I always keep going back to the uninsulated Nevada. So um, the insulation on the website, it says yes-gore, 200 grams. Okay. And that's for both the Brickstall and the Nevada. Okay, so 200 grams. And then then, uh, Nevada comes in the uninsulated version. Mm -hmm. So this Brickstall, even though it has 200 grams of insulation, it it breathes better and is cooler on my feet than the uninsulated Nevada is. Uh, yeah, Kendall just said comfort wise, hour after hour, day after day, he leans toward the the crispy Nevada uninsulated over the brick stall. Right now, I I can't say that necessarily, and I think they're just so close that so what's, you're kind of splitting hairs. So what's the difference here? Like you're saying, it's really close, but what what does the Nevada have exactly over the brick stall? I'd say the Nevada feels more like a. A slipper, a slipper, or, a sh- or sh- just kind of a yeah. It's it's just more more comfortable in terms of it being more like a an everyday shoe, an everyday deal. shoe. Yeah, and then the Brickstall does feel like a boot. I mean, it has a little more stiffness and a little more edge to it. It 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 definitely feels a little more like a boot. But man, I have so much ankle stability. It feels good. And I just need to put a lot more miles on this to see what happens as they break in over time. Leather feels good, feels better the longer you wear it. Mm-hmm. You know, I went to Italy. I sat down with the, the engineers and the designers and stuff at Crispy Boots, hung out with the Italians, and we talked about it. And I said, you know, what is it about leather? I keep going back to leather over the insulated. Because when you look at this 
uh, summit here and you look at this uh, over here, the summit, and you look at this synthetic Colorado, the other synthetic boot in this book, in this group is this brick stall. This isn't leather that's on it. It's like a faux leather kind of material. So these, these, these boots are not full grain leather. They're not all leather and leather shrinks. It conforms, it changes to your foot. And the Italians were saying, you know, there's a reason why leather has always been a popular material for footwear because leather does conform to the shape of your foot and how you walk and move. And over time, leather gets more comfortable. It also requires a little more maintenance, mm -hmm. which isn't my thing. Like I'm oil changes the in the right truck, now. like tire, it's not my thing, anything I got to take care of. But you do, I do take pretty good care of, of my uh, Nevadas. I just put oil on them. I use the crispy <clears> stuff <throat> and I smear that stuff on there and I, and I try to keep the leather somewhat protected. Uh, leather has its issues. So I wear a 10 and a half really, but in the Nevada, in all my crispy boots, I've gone to a size 11. So I go a half size bigger. Uh, and at first they're a little bit big, especially on the leather end of the spectrum. I don't, I don't go a half size bigger on all of them, but on the leather, I especially do because I have found that by you, by the time I reach 500 miles or so, 700 miles in a in a in these boots they're they've kind of just shrunk like you can see if you look at this boot especially it's around the toe box you know just this leather just kind of you know cranks Tightens you know you when you bend your toe like this and you're on your you know your toes skinning out a, mm -hmm. a bear or whatever it's just putting that crease on there and for whatever reason this little bit curls up the the toe kind of can shorten and I found that if I go with a straight 10 and a half, which is what I would normally wear, um, they'll get too tight after, you know, half a season. So I get them initially a little bit on the larger side and they're a little bit roomy, but not, not, not overly so. And then within, within uh, a two week hunt, one, two week hunt, they're kind of starting to shrink a little bit. And then within six months, they're the perfect size and I can wear them like another year of constant use and they just conform to my foot. So I think I have had people complain that their crispies shrunk on them, that they got a little too small on them. And I think that's, um, I've experienced the same thing, mm -hmm. not with my first pair, but my second pair, they did like, and when I was at the factory, one of the things that we talked about, we talked about that and they said, you know, when they design a pair of boots, like these, they take the flank of the cow and they have this hide, this leather from certain parts of the world where only this leather is found. And then, you know, then they take the boot is made out of the same side, the same piece of leather, each boot. So the left and right boot have the same degree of, mm -hmm. because it's a natural element on it that you're taking from an animal and it's a certain part of the animal. So when you put on a, a leather crispy boot, it's of a thickness and a type that's real supple. And so it feels really good right out of the box. And it, it's, it's a very, I mean, these guys know what they're doing. Build, they're, they build boots that are phenomenal. When you, often the competitor style boots, they, they come with a super thick leather. It's, it's thicker. It's not supple. It doesn't uh, conform very well. And when you put them on, they're stiff and uncomfortable and you'll hear guys complain about, you know, heel rub and other things. And they got to wear these boots like forever before they finally break in. And they talk about this break in period and then they finally get to be comfortable. Well, that's because you're dealing with some leather that's just gnarly. Crispy is building something that is good to go right away. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with a leather like that, it needs to be taken care of. You know, it's a nice leather. And um, with that suppleness... And the way it, it is, you you really need to condition it and waterproof it and and take care of it. So I have found um, that's what I've done, and they've they've lasted a real long time and worked well for me. But I do prefer leather, except these brick stalls are you know giving me pause. Now, uh, like Matt Davis, who works here over here at, uh, across the street at Mountain Ops, um, Matt has he gets out and gets after it and he loves this brick stall and in fact most of the guys at the the mountain ops building um i've seen use the brick stall primarily so 
uh, man, you know, I've been wearing it and like I said, it's a, it's a close contender for that, uh, crispy Nevada. So we'll see. I'm going to keep, keep, uh, running it through the paces and go on some hunts and see where it leaves me, but I'm excited about it. Now, the next boot I'm going to go over is the crispy Laponia. This is what Lampers wears. Uh, it's a slipper disguised as a boot. <laughs> you know, I think this is a faux leather material, kind of like the Brickstall. I'm not really sure. But this boot is, is um, you know, it breathes. It's got this neoprene tongue, like the, a lot like the, the, the Brickstall. It is a really comfortable boot. You can see the sole is super thin, low profile. So your foot is really close to the ground, which is great. It's, it's harder to sprain your ankle and stuff when your foot is like right on the ground. There's, it doesn't leave much room to roll. You know, the higher the, the sole, the more likely you can sprain it and the more narrow the sole. So a wider boot, this boot just kind of has that, um, moccasin feel, but I, but when you tighten it up and you lace it up, it has a nice boot feel. So I think like in the videos, I'll say, you know, it's like, it's like a tennis shoe with some, with the stability of a boot. So if you're a huge fan of, um, really tennis shoe type cross trainer mm -hmm. boots, you've always been into not a traditional boot when you hunt, it's really tough to beat this crispy Laponia. And that's the super, that's the lightest boot they make, right? I think so. I mean, it's like, it's like 16 ounces. Yeah. So Ryan loves this boot. Now, <clears throat> I would wear this boot as well. I love it. I love it. But it doesn't have the ankle bone support system. Mm. And I have worn it like crazy and hunted in it in Arizona uh, and messed around with it. I love stalking animals in it. And when I'm not in like rough terrain, you know, it, it is like wearing a tennis shoe. But with that extra stability. I love the boot. I just have... From experience, I'm not willing to uh, go out into the backcountry and risk spraining an ankle. So it doesn't have that stiff upper. Ryan's never, I don't know that he has ankle issues of any kind. And so, you know, for a lot of guys, this is the ticket. And uh, South Cox, I believe, loves this. Uh, there's a number of guys like Sly is in that boot all the time. James, tons of guys are, are running that Laponia. And uh, I am a big fan of um, softer, more supple boot. Less fan of the real stiff, traditional like boots. That's why. That's why I think I like the Nevada because even though it it has that traditional boot feel, you know, it's you know it's a boot for sure. But it is supple enough, and the sole is soft enough, and the stiffness and all that that it it feels. Like I got a lot of stability, especially when I'm carrying over a hundred pounds in a backpack and going straight down a mountain. Mm -hmm. You know, if if I was just day hunting, I would wear a boot that's not as stiff as the Nevada. I, I but usually I'm backpacking, and because I'm backpacking, uh, rolling my ankle or you know uh, having something go south like that is only a concern when I've got that super heavy backpack on and I'm navigating gnarly terrain. That's when I want that boot. So I wear this boot and I hunt this boot all the time because it's for when I'm carrying a heavy backpack, really. Um, otherwise, I, I choose something a little softer, like when I'm hunting in Arizona and we're kind of car hunting, you know, mm -hmm. for coos deer. We're, we cruise out there and we glass a knob and then it's like, you know, you're you're just going out after on stalks throughout the day and evening. Then I'm wearing, um, I've even worn my, crispy monocos which are just like a daily wear boot um and hunt in those killed my first coos deer in a pair of those well, actually i was barefoot because i took them off but but i yeah i wore the laponia this year on a lot of my stocks for coos deer so man there's just different boots for different times but and different uses but that laponia is a is a lamper's favorite like i said i don't think it's it's not stiff enough for me it won't work for backpack hunting in uh, tough terrain i know what'll happen i'll roll that ankle they're always ready to go so <laughs> the abss is critical so then moving on i think i talked a little bit about the summit again i like the summit uh if it had an ankle br uh, bone support system i'd wear the summit all the time that would be my early season boot that would be the the boot that i would wear constantly 
That's why I was excited when they came out with the Colorado because it had the same upper. But the sole, like I said, is a little too stiff. So if there was a boot like the Colorado or, or if there was a boat, I should say, like the Summit, but had ankle brace or ankle bone support system, that would be a sweet boot. So if you don't have ankle issues, you should really look at the Summit for an early season warm weather hunt, period. You really should. It's a great boot. I think it's often overlooked today now that Crispy has so many options, but the mm-hmm. Summit is, man, it's a nice boot. Over here, you have we have the Wild Rock. This boot is my late season for snow and icy river crossings and stuff like that. You can see it's got a really tall upper, which is nice just for when you got gators on and you're crossing a stream. They're tall enough, you know, up here, Gore-Tex, full leather, you know, uh, keeps, keeps your feet dry and they're heavily insulated. I think 600 grams. What are they? For which one? The The wild rock. Wild rock. Again, I got these in a size 11 instead of 10 and a half. I got that uh, because like I said, I have found that a half size big in all my leather, crispy leather boots is, uh, treats me better. Especially when it comes to, let's say you wear a thicker socks, you know, you have a little more, you know, in, in that regard, you need a little more room in the boot and boots that are too tight, they restrict blood flow and you, you, my feet will, can get uh, cold or the toes can go numb, things like that. So having the boot be big enough that there's some room for the blood to flow is important. So I go a little bit bigger. 800 grams. In the Wild Rock? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so folks, they're not messing around. No, they're doubly insulated over those Nevadas. The first time I was exposed to the Wild Rock, I was in British Columbia and I was moose hunting. And I was there with John Barklow from Sitka. I was wearing an insulated pair of crispy Nevadas. And uh, the waterproofing agent kind of was wearing down on that boot. Uh, I had gone back to back from one hunt to the other. And I didn't re-oil them up before I left which was a mistake. By the time I got there, we were going through snow. It was hot, cold, hot, cold each day. You're going through water, wet grass. The boots started to take on quite a bit of water. Okay. And then the leather would freeze. And so when you got on your horse and rode around, so you had a leather that was saturated with moisture, but wasn't leaking, you know, by any stretch. So the foot, the boot, the boot was dry. However, the boot was saturated with water and then it would freeze. And when it froze, the boot leather actually turned into a block of ice. <laughs> yeah, and then it, you couldn't bend the boot because it was frozen. It was actually, the leather was actually frozen. And then you would try to walk. <clears throat> and once you walked around and worked them, they'd get a little supple, but they were cold. And, and it was miserable. It was, uh, I lost the feeling in my toes for what, like two months afterward? Yeah. A uh, little... A little longer than that. You still had some days where you'd wake up and I couldn't feel my toes for Mm -hmm. months. A little Um, nerve damage. And I'm back to normal. I'm good now. But that was disturbing and surely not a good thing. And uh, I was was sitting there and the boots normally are everything I need, but for warmth. You know, I I can use them in October. I can use them even in uh, pretty light snow. But once the temperatures get, well, like get below freezing, I'd say... You know, when you're hovering above freezing and just below freezing, you know, 25 to 35 degrees, the Nevadas do a pretty good job, the insulated Nevada. But once it got below that, my feet get, get there. They're fine when you're moving around, but when you have to stop and glass for hours, it's, they just get cold. If you're in the wind, they get cold. And when you're on a horse and the wind's ripping and it's, you know, 10 degrees, it was, it was awful. And I talked to Barklow cause he looked real comfy and he had these crispy, uh, Nevada or these crispy wild rocks rather with 800 grams of insulation. <laughs> and, uh, I said to John, I'm like, dude, um, are you, know, or how are your feet doing, man? And he's like, Brian, I can honestly say that this is probably one of the first hunts I've ever been on where I've not ever even thought about my feet. Like <laughs> they've, I, <laughs> I'm just seeing Barklow completely deadpan saying he's this. Like, I, I can't even, I haven't even <laughs> thought about my feet. They're, they're, they're great. 
So I was like, all right, I got to do that. And I had been with uh, Anthony and Brock in Colorado, and uh, it was like negative five degrees, and we were hunting up in these mountains for deer. And we would sit for like six hours in the morning in frigid, frigid, icy weather glassing and all, all most of the day. And my feet were dying inside the crispy Nevada, just, just the sitting still, they, they just weren't warm enough. So I would use my sleeping bag and put my, my feet inside the bag, try to warm them up. Last year when I was on my late season hunt, uh, mule deer with Ryan, it's the same thing. The problem is you're hiking 10, 12 miles, right? I don't necessarily want to wear a boot with 800 grams of insulation that's of this kind of stature when I'm hiking mm-hmm. eight miles, you know. Because of that hyperhidrosis. They're heavy, they're hot, my feet are going to sweat a lot, and it's a it's a problem. Like, I don't want to wear something that warm for the hiking. But then once you stop moving and you're sitting around for two or three days, it's not enough boot to keep you warm. So how do you fix that problem? How do you go from, you know, extensive activity with a boot that's not too hot so your feet don't get, you know, soaked? And how do you go from that to then, you know, no activity and keep your feet warm? Uh, what I found is I, I, when I'm on a really active hunt where I'm hiking a lot, chasing up mountains and hauling packs and mostly moving with days of inactivity where you're just sitting around. What I tend to do is I, I bring foot warmers, the full length ones, the full length ones. And I go ahead and pack those and they're, they just add an element of, of just relief on a hunt like that. And also they're for you that don't know, they're like the hand warmers, but you get the, the full length foot warmers, I peel them out of the package, stick them in the boot. And then I've got the warmth that I need as I'm glassing all day. And those things make such a, a big difference because whenever you're dealing with external heat source, I mean, it's, it's a major gain in super cold weather, meaning that it's not heat. I have to internally generate it's heat. I'm stealing from some external source. It's a, it makes a huge difference. And so I'll bring those, warm up my feet that way. And, uh, I'll bring like, I don't know, a jacket or a whoopee or, a, uh, you know, my sleeping bag generally when I backpack like that and I'll, or, or even my backpack and I'll just put my boots just to block the wind in there. So I got the, the little, uh, foot warmers in there and then I got my feet inside and, uh, my feet are nice and cozy and I can glass and do my thing all day. And then if we do go on a hunt, a run and gun, run up a mountain, or we have to hike a lot of miles, I can pull those uh, heat sources out of my boots, <clears throat> chuck them in my backpack or my jacket pocket, whatever. And, uh, I can continue the hike and then I can put them back in my boots. And usually they last like a day. I can just kind of pull them in and out as needed for, for, uh, warmth. I have worn the wild rock for, I've been trying to see how the wild rock treats me for just all day hiking and then stopping. And uh, I did a hunt with them, a couple hunts like that so far. And although my feet get really sweaty, you know, and they're a little heavier and more robust of a boot for just that all day hiking, I have found that my feet are warmer. So even though the boot is a little sweaty and my feet are a little wet, they still are warm. So do I care too much about the moisture? That's the question I'm asking myself right now. Then I don't need foot warmers to bring along. So it's, you know, I'm kind of experimenting with that. The other thing that I run into with late season that I struggle with is, uh, you know, the adrenaline, the running, the heavy hiking and all of that saturate the boot with sweat and three or four days in to the hunt or a week into the hunt, like, like our mule deer, we were there 14 days, I think is 14 or 16. Mm -hmm. We were there a long time. You're way back there. The feet would get soaking wet and uh, after a week of just sweating like crazy in the boot, oversaturating the sock, staying on the move, the boot itself took on moisture inside, like a lot of moisture in the, these insulation uh, pockets. And you, like, you can't get the boot to dry out internally because although we have a stove, 
in our seek outside teepee, you don't want your boot like right up on it because it'll shrink it and it's not good for the leather to go hot, cold. Usually they're, they are a little bit wet. So how do you dry the inside of your boot without, you know, overheating the outside and leather's terrible when you're trying to dry the inside. It's there's so much heat that affects the outside of your leather boot without actually it's like insulated in reverse. It it just keeps the inside wet. If it's wet, that's why it's such a, uh, a terrible thing to get your boot wet inside. Like in it's leather, you're kind of screwed unless you have some sort of boot warmer. So that's a dilemma that I'm facing like uh, fresh socks that soak up a lot of that moisture and then change them and fresh and that can kind of help or just avoid the boot getting that sweaty and, and, and so, and soaking up that much moisture. It's not like I stepped into a river or snow and the snow got into the boot and wicked down and got my feet wet. It's not like that. I just internally create so much sweat that it's as though I dumped water into the boot. It's the same dilemma. How do you get that much moisture out of the boot when it's negative five degrees outside? It's tough. And when I was in New Zealand, Luke had this little portable boot dryer, the little fan, and he just poof, slipped it in. And, uh, but it, it ran on the cigarette lighter in the car. And so we were, we were on that hunt and we were like, he plugged it in. It was tiny little thing, not very heavy, little plastic thing, shoved it in the boots, turned it on. Boots were dry as a bone, like within an hour or two. And that's really what it takes is some kind of boot dryer to get the airflow in and out of that boot to dry, to dry that moisture, excess moisture. I haven't found anything that is backpack worthy yet, but man, if, if I could find uh, something that ran on USB that would go into the boot and air dry it out, I just can't imagine I'm the only guy with that problem on extended hunts where my boot gets sweaty inside and just won't dry. And day after day, it gets more sweat, more sweat, more sweat, until it's like I'm wearing a wet boot. It's really uncomfortable. Again, kind of this dilemma, this this conundrum you deal with when you're dealing with hot and cold issues. Extreme hot, but because of the hiking and the movement, and then extreme cold and the boot taking on moisture. It's just, it can be, it can, it can be a problem. But, you know... So you can find ways to make it all work and and you do, but I would say that just in a nutshell, I would say the Crispy Nevada uninsulated is my go-to boot. The Brickstall might replace it for hot, hot weather earlier season. I'm not sure yet. The Brickstall is such, they're, they're real close right now. I love the Crispy Nevada insulated for September, October, even into early November. Once it gets real cold, like you're starting to deal with lots of snow and more glassing than than hiking. It's the crispy wild rock for sure. And, you know, I might actually wear the wild rock for super late season this year instead of the Nevada and instead of foot warmers. Uh, but we will, we will, I'll experiment with that to see which I prefer more. I've got a lot of hunts I get to test this year. Uh, but when in doubt, when I'm a little worried that I may not have a boot that's quite warm enough, man, it's really tough to beat packing in, you know, six or seven pairs of those, uh, foot warmers, full length footbed foot warmers. They add a little weight to the pack, but they're worth their weight in gold, in my opinion, um, for, for those conditions. So, and when you're up there with everybody else and their feet are cold, when you throw those things in your boot, you're you're the envy of everyone <laughs> on the mountain. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of this in a nutshell. Now let's talk a little bit about socks. I think socks are huge, huge, and everybody's a little different. So so I want to go through what I think is the foundation of of my system that I that I love. This is a smart wool sock liner that I bought in two thousand seven okay and uh it just it just finally gave up the ghost on the last hunt this sock i wore for like i would say i wore probably 200 days out of the year for like 10 years not joking like i wore these not just in hunting but in life they're phenomenal and if you get on um 
Amazon or REI and you look up some of the reviews, you'll have guys talk about how they've had some of these smart wool sock liners for 10 years, seven years, five years of 360 days a year wear. There's something about merino wool that just, uh, it, it wicks the moisture away, keeps your feet from getting hot. Synthetic just doesn't do the job. Any kind of synthetic sock liner, I'll, I'll saturate with sweat and, and it will be useless within a day. I can wear these for three days in a row with serious sweating, four days even, before I got to go, okay, they're like cardboard. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to rinse them out in the river and then let them kind of hang, you know, try to get some of the salt and sweat out of them and try to dry them. So I, you know, I usually will do that on an extended hunt. I'll wear this two or three days. Then I'll try to wash it in the river a little bit, and then I'll get an extra couple days toward the end of the hunt out of them. In the meantime, I'll rotate to another pair. Now, they quit making this, and they came out with another one. And uh, the other sock was like this. So, again, smart wool sock liner. And I, and I got these, and uh, they're, they weren't as good. They're not as good. But in, in terms of they're not as long-lasting as my other pair. They've, uh, and they're a little thicker, which I don't like. I preferred how thin. Those were kind of like a pantyhose almost, merino. And these are a little bit thicker. Uh, and I think the, the way they are when they're this thick, they, they kind of hold the moisture. It doesn't transfer it so much into the next layer of sock. The whole point of this is just so that when my feet are sweaty, this pulls that sweat right off my foot, wicks it up, and then passes it into the next layer of sock, which then can breathe a little more and air out a little more. Um, but this next to skin moisture is minimal. Now, this sock, it, it's still a great sock. It, it, uh, it performs really well. Again, it's straight up wool. Then they came out with this sock. Uh, actually, I don't know which one is the newer of them. But this is another smart wool. Uh, I actually prefer this one for its weight and thickness. It's a little thinner. But if you go on there and you review the, the and you read the reviews of these smart wool, the latest ones, which I don't have, you can see the little smart wool guy on the bottom of the sock. You know, mm -hmm. uh, smart wool is written across the top here, and it's just a little black sock. This one again is a little bit thicker, and uh, only has the smart wool here on the toe. No. Oh, it does have a little green guy underneath. The new ones say smart wool down the side here, down the whole thing. And it's like embossed on there with something. And people are hating on that sock. They're hating on it. And they're like, uh, I wore these for like a month and got holes in them already. What the hell happened? You know, I've been wearing my other pair for 10 years. What's going on? So um, I don't know what's going on at smart wool, but... This has been a money maker forever. It's been tried and true. These these thin merino wool liners are the best that I have found. Uh, I don't know what's going on. As I got on there to buy some more, what's going on with uh, the current production line and how well they perform? I'm still going to get some and see, but uh, that's that's my go to, and it has been fail proof. I have some synthetic ones made by other companies or a merino synthetic blend. And they're okay, but they do not perform like this true wool does, like this straight up all merino. What are you looking up, Brent? You find anything online about them? I was looking up to see if they like changed ownership or anything, but I'm not seeing anything like that. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Lampers and Jeff Lusk they they loved these socks and told me you the should Ninjinji. Yeah, the Ninjinji. Uh, five toe socks they're like man they're just great they used them on the 100 mile death hike and blah 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 yeah big mistake for me huge mistake for me and it's i don't know how much their wool how much they're you know a different blend but i got them because they highly recommended them well they must not have hyper hydrosis <laughs> right mm -hmm. is that what it's called these things soaked up so much moisture, just just like these wool ones do. But they didn't. The moisture didn't wick out of them. Mm -hmm. They're too thick. They didn't. I think they're maybe thick, but I think they may not be wool. And that natural fiber is a big deal. Wh whatever the reason, these things soaked up moisture, 
and it was like wearing a wet sock. And then my outer sock, it, it just gave me blisters. I mean, I didn't get blisters, but I was on the edge like for three days. My feet were raw. Mm. I was walking around like an old man trying not to get blisters. I was taking my boots off a lot. It was a huge mistake. That whole hunt, I was like struggling not to that whole first week until we got back to base camp and then I could swap out their crappy recommendation and pick up the smart wool liners. Once I put these on game, it was like back to normal feet were great. I could just crush hills and mountains with, with impunity. So the liner for me is, is the game changer, the, the big deal, the major thing. And I think some guys have never tried a liner. I don't really know. I know when I have a liner in, and I'm hiking and moving that friction. I don't have the same amount of friction with a liner because the liner rubs against the second layer sock mm -hmm. instead of my skin rubbing against it. For whatever reason, it just works. So when I wear a liner, I can throw on that boot and just rock and roll. And I don't have any foot problems. I don't have to tape my feet for sock line, you know, anything like that. So socks are huge, huge. Now, this is the Gore sock, um, and uh, it's made out of some, like, futuristic fiber that that Gore came up with. Uh, I got it at a Sitka event. Barklow got a ton of these, and they're made out of some fiber, which he explained to me, which, are, which is a phenomenal fiber, and the best socks I've ever owned and used. Again, I've been wearing these for, like, four or five years, put, put them through hell and back, Went and bought a ton more. Everyone did who had this sock. Went and found wherever they were because they had discontinued them and bought as many pairs as they could. Unfortunately, Gore doesn't make the sock. Um, they've put the fiber on the back burner and it's proprietary so no one else can copy it. And so whatever this fiber is, and Barclow described it to me, ah, it's a phenomenal sock. It's ridiculous. Best sock. Best sock hands down. But... I can't find them anymore, and I've kind of worn through them. So this year, I've been uh, using some more socks uh, the last year and a half, really, because I've I wore through those gore. And I have a few pair that I like. So my favorite, I think, right now is my Darn Tough. I think the Darn Tough uh, wool socks are right up there around my favorite. And they, for those that know, they're just also durable. Like they're never, they're going to last forever. I think they have a lifetime warranty. Really? Yeah. Something crazy like that. So the darn tough is a, is a good sock. Uh, Kendall card recommended farm to feet. I got two pairs of farm to feet socks. Uh, he loves them. He does a lot of um, endurance races and things like that. I have one pair I like, the heavier weight ones, and uh, I have a lighter pair I don't like at all. And if I were to choose, I still think I like the Darn Tough more than the Farm to Feet. Another wool sock that I like is, well, it's been a long time, but First Light. Their, their uh, wool sock, I, I used to have a couple pair. And those First Light wool socks were great. I really liked those. They lasted quite a while, felt good. They were hard to get on. They were tight, like tiny, like tight, but to beat Merino wool to begin with, just wool in general. So um, that's kind of where I'm at there. I, I, I'm going to try some more socks, but Darn Tough is making a great sock. I think Smart Wool, I do have some Smart Wool outer layer socks. Um, I don't like super thick, puffy socks. Uh, now, when it gets to be really late season and it's cold, I don't mind throwing on some for the later season. But in general, I like a mid-weight to lightweight sock with the sock liner, and that's the combo for me. I think sometimes guys get too thick a sock and thick, thick socks. I think they actually cause more friction and more discomfort than a sock that's a little thinner, but it's a balance. And, you know, we were on this last hike and a dude was showing me his socks. He's like, man, my feet have been struggling. I'm like, dude, that is not enough sock. That sock is so thin and you have no liner either. You know, um, you need a little more than that so that mid-weight sock you know probably where it's at uh, these gore socks are surprisingly thin that's all i need though it's all i needed with uh this stuff 
and uh, and a sock liner. Anyway, that's that's that. Now I'm gonna cover one more thing, and that is these uh, sheep feet foot inserts or orthotics. I've got them right now in the brick stalls because I went on a hike just recently. And uh, this is the sheep feet. For those that missed the podcast, I did a podcast on these with uh, the guys at Sheep Feet. This orthotic, this custom orthotic is built and shaped to my foot. And uh, they take an impression of your foot and then they build the orthotic based on the shape of your foot. And uh, this is mine. And I started wearing these. Ryan's been wearing them, I don't know, more than half a year. Used them on uh, all our hunts, Arizona to to all the hunts that we've done um, on the bears, hiking tremendous levels of miles. He runs them in the Laponia. So I got a pair, and I used to run the Super Feet, the little green ones that you buy at the store, and they were pretty good. But they always had a break in time, and they all and they still kind of hurt. They didn't quite always fit just right, and they were a little put a little pushy on the arch of my foot. This. I, I still have to use them, but man, it's, it's like your foot is in this, you got this heel cup, your foot is in there. It's super comfy. It's, it's almost ridiculously comfortable. And then as I'm hiking mile after mile after mile, I'm not getting this kind of arch fatigue or foot fatigue that I've gotten in the past. And so far I'm really impressed with these. They, they seem to add a whole level of stability to my boot making it the footbed just that much more comfortable. And as I stand, you know, and I, as I move and I hike a hill and I'm on an edge, it's like that, that orthotic really does enhance the quality of the boot. So, so far, so far I'm really impressed. And, uh, I think it's, it's been a great addition. I def, I definitely recommend it and they're good dudes. They came on the podcast. We have a, we are working with them. If you use the code GRITTY, you get cheap feet. You get a, a pretty good discount. So check those guys out. There's a link in the description field of the, the YouTube video for this podcast. And and like I said, if you're struggling with any kind of foot pe- fatigue, you got any like plantar fasciitis, things like that, I think this would be a, 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 a big help for that. Um, it's just weird. It's like those orthotics just take away a lot of the, the fatigue, foot fatigue you have at the end of the day. And during the day, it just, it gives, it feels like it just made that boot that much more stable. I could see how if I ran them in the Laponia, because they add a little stiffness as a, you know, to what's there already, it could be a nice combo. I haven't done it yet, but, um, if it only had the ankle bone support system. But anyway, that's that's kind of my thoughts in a nutshell. If I miss something or you want me to cover some some some, some of this in more detail, you know, you send me a question. Typically through YouTube is best. Just log on there and leave a comment, ask us a question there. Brent will go through, you can go in the back end of YouTube and we can just, just like search questions. And we can kind of keep track of ones we responded to, ones we haven't. It's a nice way to respond. And it's typically where we try to engage the most. So if you get on the YouTube channel and uh, get on the comment section, <coughs> we'll you know fire away there. We had a problem with our email, by the way, folks. So we were asleep at the wheel. I was out hunting bears. Okay. So I missed the whole <laughs> that our email quit working. So if you logged on and gave us your email... Or signed up for the newsletter. Signed up for the newsletter. <clears throat> um, it didn't work. If you've sent us an email, it didn't work. A lot of guys were like, hey, did you get my email? And, you no. know, I started looking through it. And we haven't got emails for three months. Mm-hmm. Three months. No, no one has been able to subscribe to the newsletter for three months. So if you've tried to subscribe to the newsletter and you haven't been getting the newsletter, that's why. Yeah, the... The uh, if you sent us an email and you wrote like a book, which some people do, like long email, we really appreciate it. But it went into no man's land. It didn't yeah. do anything. Go to your sent, copy, paste, and resend it to us. <laughs> we're, was, we are we are like hawks now watching these things. But it was a, it was bad, uh, folks. It just totally um, 
was the it it just totally disconnected from the system and it, there was no intake whatsoever for it so sorry about that anyway uh yeah send us you can send us a question it works and it works now you can get on the email and uh send us a question there but we like youtube and we'll sit down and talk about it some more on the podcast mm-hmm. if if you want us to go into more detail uh, if you have a question about another boot, I can ask the guys over at crispy. Yeah. I can interview some other folks. Just let me know what you're thinking. If, if I left something out, if you had a question that crossed your mind, but this is kind of my take, my take and how I run it. Like I said, if I had to pick a only one boot, I would do an insulated crispy Nevada and I'd roll, roll with that. And I'd get it a half size, big, bigger than your normal, than your normal foot, foot size. I'd run the uh, smart wool, the thinnest smart wool merino liner I can run, and I think I'd run a darn tough uh, mid-weight to lightweight sock, depending on the season. And if it's super cold, I'd get some foot warmers to run in there, and I'd get the sheep feet to uh, really add some stability and and uh, keep your foot healthy and all of that. So kind of the summary there uh, for but if I had uh, money to spend, I'd spend it in, for late season on the Wild Rock, hands down. And uh, you might try the Brickstall over the Nevada. And if you're a stiff boot guy, like a bunch of guys were on this last hike, the Colorado is pretty legit. So hope that helps. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, as always, support us by uh, using the code GRITTY at Mountain Ops. Use the code at Alpaca Rafts. Use the code of goat knives. Uh, all the codes can be found in the description field. Um, Valkyrie archery, another another uh, great one this time of year. Seek outside uh, for shelter. All the things you can find the codes right there in the description field. Click those links. Use our codes, and that helps us uh, do what we do. Heather's choice. Now is time to get some backcountry food, some packaroons things like that. Order yourself some uh, protein bars from Mountain Ops. Been smashing those uh, peanut butter ones and the chocolate and the caramel. I think though that I'm, I've been enjoying the chocolate a lot lately for some reason. M- my wife says it's because it's like that time for me. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that the, uh, the peanut butter is um, hard to beat. And uh, it's kind of like having a Snickers bar without all the negative downsides. So mm. check it out. It's a tasty little treat. Great for backpacking. And uh, I'm digging that. And, uh, yeah. So thanks for tuning in, folks. We appreciate it. And stay gritty.